Welcome to Drive the DAF. Clear, structured explanation of the daily DAF in 20 minutes. You can even follow in the car. Shachzer and DAF Ayin test begins shortly after a Mishnah. It contains another two Mishnahs. So the beginning of the, the DAF following the Mishnah is discussing how you fill in a ditch between two courtyards in order to make them considered one courtyard. And we will also talk about the rest of the cases in the most recently learned Mishnah. Then we get to another Mishnah which talks about a wall between two courtyards made out of a heap of straw. When you're allowed to eat from that heap of straw, when you have to be concerned that the heap of straw might become too small to divide the courtyards into two separate yards, and you won't notice. That'll take us pretty far to the next Mishnah, which will discuss how exactly you create an Erev uh, Chatseris or a Shitufe Mavois with a barrel of wine, and how you're Mizaka it, how you give it without their presence to the other residents of the Mavoi or the Chatser. And then we'll have a list of halacha said by the old men of Pompetisa. So, first of all, we're discussing a situation in which you have a ditch that is dividing two uh, courtyards, meaning that the ditch runs along the length of the middle of a courtyard and divides it into two separate yards such that you don't consider them to be one joint yard. You can't make an air of chatzeres between the two of them. They each make their own air of chatzeres. We had seen in the mission that if it's filled, then it's considered one yard. And then the question is filled with what? So we said filled with straw doesn't work as a filling. Filled with stones or gravel does work as a filling. The Gemara wants to know filled with stone and gravel. What, what kind of situation is that? That you're planning on leaving it there, or you're not planning on leaving it there. Now, the assumption is that when the Mishnah says you filled it with stone and gravel, you didn't show any intent of leaving or not leaving. So the Gemara asks, Do you mean to tell me that if you fill it with stone or gravel, with sand or gravel, without any express intent, we assume that it's going to stay there and it counts as a filling? I'll prove to you, otherwise, I'll prove to you that gravel and sand as filling something does not count as a permanent filling if you did not express. Uh, explicit intent to leave it there. What's the case? Tamisha Masachas Allah Stalacha is that tuma, a mace, which is in a room, if it has a space of at least a tefa height, it stays within the room. It doesn't go up through the roof. If however it's squeezed in, it's called a tuma ritsutza. It doesn't have a space a a halal an area of at least one tefa height, then it bursts out through the roof and goes straight up to the heavens and is matame anything above it. Now the question is, what if it's in a house which has plenty of space, but the house is filled with sand or gravel, and that sand or gravel minimizes the available space, and now it has less than a tefak there. Do we consider that sand or gravel permanent and going to stay there, and therefore the tumma is squashed and it explodes out of the roof? Or do we say, no, the sand or gravel is not considered permanent, and we don't look at it, and the tumma has plenty of room? So the Mishnah says that... Uh, it's only if you expressed intent to leave it there. If you just did it stam without any expressed intent, then we assume that it's going to disappear. It's not going to stay there, and the tumma is considered to be having plenty of room. Meaning, in that mission, we see that if you didn't express an intent, then the stones and the sand are not considered to be permanent. So how come in our case of the ditch, where we're filling in the ditch so that I can combine the two sides of the ditch into one chutzar, how come there, if you just fill it up with sand or gravel, it is considered permanent if you didn't express any intent. So the Gemara is going to offer three answers here. The Gemara first says, well, the Mishnah in Allah says Rabbi Yaisi. Rabbi Yaisi is the one who holds that it is um, not considered to be permanent if you uh, didn't express any intent. The Gemara right away asks that that can be because of Rabbi Yaisi, where Rabbi Yaisi says the opposite. Rabbi Yaisi says that stones and gravel are considered permanent if you didn't express any intent, straw is not permanent. Stones or gravel are. Obviously, in either of those, if you express intent to remove it, then it's not permanent. And if you express intent to keep it, then it is permanent. But if you didn't express any intent, straw is going to go and stones and gravel are going to stay. So this brysa in Olas can't be Rebiesi. So it's the opposite. No, no, what I, what I meant to say was the brysa here, Masech HaShabbos, that's Rebiesi. The one in Olas, that's someone else. Okay, fine, that's one answer. The Gemara gives another answer. The Gemara says, this is Rav Huna Brei Rav Yeshua. The Gemara says, what do you mean? This is Shabbos. So on Shabbos, you can't move sand and gravel. It's mukta. So, of course, that's going to stay there. Straw is not mukta because it's food. You can feed it to your animals. The Gemara gives another answer. The Gemara says, you can't compare a ditch to a house. Sand and gravel in a house is not going to stay there. People don't keep sand and gravel filling up their house. A ditch is meant to be filled in. So, sand and gravel is going to stay there. So, that's logical that it's 
meant to stay there, and that's not surprising that it stays there. Okay, the Gemara now refers to the next line in our mission, where we had seen that if you have a board of wood, a plank of wood, you want to place it across the ditch in order to bridge the gap and combine the two courtyards into one. You can do that, but the board has to be at least four tochem wide. says, Rav, that's only if you're using the board as a bridge. But if you're using the board to make the ditch narrower, meaning it's not crossing the ditch, it's being attached to one side of the ditch in order to make the ditch narrower, then it doesn't have to be four tochem wide. It just has to be wide enough to make sure that the ditch is no longer four tochem wide. Okay, next thing in the Mishnah was, where we had seen if you have two porches, or two things that stick out of upper floors of houses across from each other, uh, they are, and you want to put a plank of wood between the two of them, so you can combine the two upper floors, the two dwellings across the street from each other into one. So um, that's good, as long as the porches are directly across from each other. Says Rava, they don't have to be directly across from each other, they could be a little bit above, one of a bit above the other or to the side of the other as long as they're not offset by more than three tvachim but if it's three tvachim or less then it's fine or if it's less than three tvachim it's fine three tvachim itself would be an issue if it's less than three then it's fine uh, because then it's still considered to be lovelet it would just be considered you would end up with a bridge the bridge would be a little bit bent and curvy here and there but it would still be a good bridge okay that concludes that discussion. Now we get to the next Mishnah. The Mishnah discusses what happens when you have a large heap of straw dividing a courtyard into two separate yards. So that counts as a serious wall as long as it is 10 tvachim high and it extends across the length of the courtyard or the width of the yard um, or the there is no space of 10 amis and for tvachim as we've seen earlier. But over here we have the heap of straw extends across the yard. So the Mishnah says, if it extends across the yard and it's ten, the Tochem High divides into two separate yards, you may not make one combined Erev Chatseris. Each now half yard has to make its own Erev Chatseris with its residents. And not only that, says the Mishnah, but the people on each side of the heap of straw are allowed to feed their animals from the straw. They're allowed to bring their animals there to eat, and the animals will eat. What's the uh, great heter? We're not concerned that, they, that the animals eating will make the heap of straw too low, because once heap of straw becomes less than 10 tfachim, so if it's less than 10 tfachim high in one four tefach wide space, so then the two yards have the option of remaining separate in separate Eruv Echatzeris or joining in one grand Eruv Echatzeris. So that's fine, because they have separate Eruv Echatzeris. But if it becomes less than 10 Tvachim along the length of the yard or along a length of 10 Amis, now they have to join in one combined Eruv, and they're not. They're joined in separate Eruv, and therefore you it would end up being forbidden for them to carry in these yards. But still, says the Mishnah, we're not concerned that that may happen on Shabbos. Via the eating of the animals, you're allowed to have the animals eat from there. Okay, says the Gemara statement of Rav Huna, the animals are allowed to come eat, but you may not fill up a box of straw from the heap and feed it to the animals. Rashi has two understandings here. One is that it's muktzah. The other one is that if you're filling up a box, we're afraid you are going to make it too low, and therefore it's forbidden. The Gemara has two opposite questions on this. First of all, the Gemara says, uh, and you are allowed to bring your animal there to feed? You shouldn't be able to do that either. Don't we know that there's a gzerim in You're not allowed to bring your animal to stand on muktza objects that it wants to eat because we're afraid you're going to pick them up and feed it to him and you'll touch m- 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 muktza. Now, if it's standing on grass, which is growing, where it's an iser derisa for you to cut them off, that we're not afraid you're going to do. Because you're, you're, you'll be wary of an iser derisa. If it's only an iser derisa, like muktza, or this hay, which has two possibly suri derabanan attached muktza, and the fact that you're going to destroy the wall and end up carrying so in that situation, we are concerned. So how come you're allowed to bring the animal here to eat to eat from the heap of straw? So Gemara says, this is different. Uh, you're not actually bringing it there. What you're doing is, is you're standing in its way so that it ends up walking there on its own, and then you're causing it to go there. If that's all you're doing, we're not afraid that you're going to actually end up feeding it by hand. Now the Gemara has the opposite question. Are you, is it really true? that you're not allowed to feed it by hand. I'll bring you a brysa that says that you are allowed to feed it by hand. The rest is a very similar case, except instead of the heap of straw being between two houses, between two yards, the heap of straw is inside a house, it's dividing the house in half, and each half of the house opens into a separate yard that has other residents in it, and the straw divides the half and house, the half, the house, into halves, and each half can only join with its own chatzar, cannot have a large Erev chaseris, including both sides of the house and the two chaseris on either side of the house. You're not allowed to do that. However, this b'risa does say 
that you're allowed to bring your animals to feed from the uh, house, from the heap of straw inside the house. You're even allowed to feed it, fill up a box and feed it by hand. So you see that you are allowed to do that. Now the Brisa ends off, we're going to need this, the Brisa ends off and it says that if the heap gets lower, it gets too low, then you have to combine into one area of Chatzar, so you don't have one. So what could you do in the meantime? The owner of the house can lock his house and be um, mevatel his rishos in the chatzar, and at least the other people in the chatzar will be able to make an Arab of without him. Their existing Arab of still works, the one that they had before. He, his house, connects to a different chatzar. By him being mevatel his rishos and locking his door, that closes all that off, and the, the rest of the chatzar remains as before. So anyway, the Gemara's question is, how come here you're allowed to feed it with direct feeding from the box? The Gemara is not a problem. Here, there's a roof. Since it's inside a house and there's a roof, you'll notice if it gets significantly lower. When it's out on the field, you don't have any f- frame of reference. You won't see if it gets too low, and it may get too low without you realizing it. And then you'll end up carrying in a place where you don't have a sufficient day roof. But here, you have a roof. If it gets too low, you will notice. Okay. The Gemara says, hold on a second. Uh, I have another question here. If you're telling me that um, this wall of hay is good enough to divide the house into two, um, you didn't tell me that it goes all the way up to the ceiling. You just told me as long as it's 10 tefachim high. That seems to indicate that a wall inside a house, as long as it's 10 tefachim high, divides it in half, even if it doesn't go up into the ceiling. Well, we had a machokas about that way back in Parakadar, on the Ayin Beis, um, where we brought multiple opinions about that. We had three opinions on the subject. This is a clear proof to one of them. So Gemara says, actually the ceiling is uh, slightly less than 13 tefachim high, and therefore it's within 3 tefachim of the ceiling, that's why it's okay. Actually, the Gemara brings another opinion that says the ceiling doesn't even have to be less than 13 tefachim high, it could be 10 tefachim high, but the wall of straw gets to within 3 tefachim of the ceiling, and that's enough. So the Gemara says, hold on a second, how is that okay? Uh, it says if it's less than 10 tefachim high, it's not a wall anymore. The Gemara means if it's less than the halacha of 10 tefachim high, which is that it's either 10 tefachim high, or it's within 3 tefachim of the ceiling, and the ceiling is 10 tefachim high. Okay, now the Gemara refers to the fact that the we said in the Brisa that if the uh, straw level drops below 10 tefachim, then everybody's forbidden, because there's no air between the two halves of the chatzar anymore, and now the two halves of the chatzar are, are really one. So you know, the Gemara says, you see a halacha here, that if people move into a chatzar, if a chatzar increases resonance on Shabbos, it becomes usher now. And that wasn't something that was clear to us before. We had thought maybe it's only in the beginning moments of Shabbos that uh, the residents of the chatzar count. Somebody who comes in the middle doesn't make it usher. But here you see that the two chatzars became joined because the wall became lower, because the cows are eating the straw, and now it's considered like there's new residents in the chatzar, and it's a problem. The Gemara says, no, not necessarily. We said that if it's less than 10 tefachim, it's a problem. That doesn't mean that it happened on Shabbos. It became less than 10 tefachim before Shabbos. It could mean that just as well. Okay, now the Gemara asks, how come we said that uh, if the guy wants to fix the problem, he should lock his door and be mavatal his rishos? Locking your door is a way of being mavatal your usage rights in the chatzar. So I have to do both of them. So the Gemara gives two answers. One is either or. We didn't say yes to do both. It was either or. The other one is that, no, he should be mavatal his rishos in the chatzar. Locking his door is just to keep him from carrying his own things out into the chatzar. He's not allowed to anymore because he doesn't have rights in the chatzar anymore. It's a different rishos. It's not part of Bittu Rishos. It's just in order to keep him from actually carrying into the Chaser itself. Okay. Next thing we had said is that once it happens, it's forbidden for him to carry on to the Chaser. The Gemara says that is Pashut. What's a Chiddush here? The Gemara says the Chiddush is that if the other people in the Chaser were Mavatal Rishos to him or Mavatal it back to him, he doesn't get his Rishos back. We hold that you cannot undo a Bittu Rishos. And the last halacha that the Bryce had said was that the same thing applies, oh, this is actually in the Mishnah, the same thing applies the, if you have a heap of straw between two tchumin. It's literally on the border between two tchumin. People are allowed to bring their animals to eat from. The Gemara says, yeah, what's a chiddush here? Why should that be more of an issue? The Gemara says, well, we're afraid, we, you may have potentially thought that we are afraid that you're going to end up carrying from one side of the tchum to the other tchum, uh, you'll bring from one chum to another chum, that's not an issue, even according to Rabbi Kiva, who holds that chumin are an iser de oiraisa. Okay, now we get to the next Mishnah. The Mishnah discusses how you make a shetufim bevois, and the Mishnah says you take a barrel of wine, you place it in one of the chutzers, and you are mezake, that means you transfer ownership to all the members, all the people who live in houses that open into this mavoi. Now, how do you do this zikoi? How do you transfer ownership to them? So you give it, you give the barrel of wine 
to any of his children who are adults, who are responsible for their own finances, or to his Eved Ivri or Shifcha uh, or Amma Ivriya, uh, they are also responsible for their own finances, or to his wife, who is also independent finances. But you cannot give it to your small children under Bar Mitzvah. Minors don't have their own finances, or Eved Kanani, they don't have their own finances. Anybody doesn't have their own finances. If you give it to them, it's like you placed it from your left hand to your right hand. It's not a transfer over Shos. In order to be able to transfer this to someone else, this person who's receiving it from you has to be acting as that person's agent, which means he has to be an independent rishos from you. So the Gemara says that when you're transferring it, you have to lift up the barrel from the ground at least a tefach, otherwise it's not a transfer of rishos. Says Rav, this is one of the halachas we learned from the old men of Pompidisa. Uh, another one, there's another halacha we learned from them, and these are the two halachas we learned from those old men, that somebody who makes kiddush has to drink at least a cheekful of wine, and if not... He's not yet. So the Gemara says, hold on a second, there are more things that the old men of Pompadisa have taught us. And Rav Chaviva says, uh, they taught us the um, halacha of Rav Yehuda in the name of Shmuel, that if you have a woman who just gave birth and she needs heat, you're allowed to make a fireplace for her on Shabbos. People thought that it meant only for a woman who gave birth, but not for somebody who's just ill. The Gemara says that's not true. You're allowed to make a Shabbos for some, uh, fire for someone who's ill, like someone who had bloodletting, uh, whether it's the s- winter or even during the summer. You're allowed to do all these things. If he's chilled and he needs a fire, you're allowed to do that. those things, even in the Thomas when it's really hot. Says a Mamer, another Allah we learned from the old men of Pompadisa. That how can you tell an Asherah tree? How do you know when a tree was used as an Avodazar and therefore it's forbidden, even if uh, there isn't any sign on it that says Asherah? How do you know? So um, the way you know is if you have the servants of the Goyim, the idol worshippers, watching the tree but not eating from it. Why would they be watching it? Why would it be so important to them and they're not eating from it? Uh, unless it was a special idol tree. Shmuel says if they said that the dates are used to make beer for the Avodazar called Nitzirfi, so that's also a proof because that's what they drink on their holiday. Gemara adds that the halacha is like Shmuel, that is something that was brought from the Saba, the Pompadisa, the old man of Drive the Daf is a project of the Grand Woodland School and is presented by Rabbi Yitzchak Landa. Find us on YouTube or subscribe to daily emails by emailing drivethedaf at gmail.com.